it goes beyond he's hot, he's holy. Welcome to the Gifted Child Symposium podcast, where we use our exceptional close reading skills and essay writing tactics to analyze the literature that truly matters. This time, we're doing a deep dive into The Twilight Saga by Stephanie Meyer. My name is Mijin. I'm Felicia. Uh, yeah, and welcome to the podcast. So we're doing Twilight, which we wrote an intro for, but like, do, do we need to, right? Like, everyone knows Twilight. It's that teenage romance, highly successful for reasons beyond our knowledge book series that then became an adaptation about a um, sparkly vampire that falls in love with a useless human. And it was just like a worldwide sensation. And we were definitely part of that. Oh, yeah. And I mean, like, you may have been Team Jacob. You may have been Team Edward. You may have also been Team Anti-Twilight. But everyone had and probably still has an opinion you know, you, you might still be on that train of like hating Twilight, thinking it's stupid, or you may be like us, um, because we're very much part of the so-called Twilight Renaissance, which has had, you know, there's been a resurgence of Twilight memes and discourse in the last few years. And I mean, we're more than happy to be continuing to contribute towards that. We, I think I was in both trains of like, I'm not like other girls, like Twilight is, says nothing, but also I loved it. And I went to the midnight premiere of like, at least the last three films. Um, yeah, I think I, re- I started reading Twilight when I was like 10, which mm-hmm. I don't know if that's appropriate. <laughs> no, yeah, I, so Twilight was one of the first book series I read like in, in English, like by myself. Um And I also was like nine or 10, I want to say, when I read them, which is way too young. Having reread them recently, as in today, uh, definitely too young. It is a very much a YA romance series. And like, yes, it's very censored, but like, oof. I mean, we were seven when the books came out. We were 10 when the films came out. Um, But also maybe that's why we had no critical thinking. And that's why we still are are out here talking about it in our mid-20s. Yeah, and I do think it's interesting, like, because I don't mean, I don't know about you, but I very much went from like a so-called twihard without even knowing it, you know, like when I was like 10, 11 before I was actually on the internet. And then the internet happened and it was suddenly split into that faction of like, I'm either not like other girls and I hate Twilight or I love Twilight, Team Edward, Team Bella, Team Bella, same, Team Jacob, uh, <laughs> Team Bella for me. Um, but yeah, I think it was interesting going from that because it was immediately like, ooh, these are like fun books. Like literally who cares? Like I didn't give much thought to them to, oh wow, these are like morally repulsive. And if you like them and enjoy them, you are also morally repulsive. That does something to a teenage girl's psyche, I think. There's been just so much discourse around it. Like, is Bella good heroine? Is Twilight feminist or anti-feminist? Like, is it even good? Is it even good? (laughs) Is it even good? Yeah. Is it like vampire fiction or like, just really really bad prose i think we're here to argue that that doesn't matter i think now in the year of our lord 2023 it's more interesting to both of us we have decided for our first episode to talk about the mormon influences (laughs) and like post questions around twilight post both of us graduating from an english degree um and a master's in your case um about you know how twilight relates to genesis the fall of man how how intellectual is it and and how literary it is as someone with a degree in early modern english literature i'm here to compare twilight directly to paradise lost by john milton (laughs) (laughs) and if you don't know anything about stephanie meyer she is the mormon queen she is Mormon and she went to BYU the very famous uh, Mormon University in Utah she married her husband when she was 21 who she met when she was a kid in Arizona and there was like a very strong narrative in the 2010s and like around the books and like her fame about her being like a Mormon housewife turned author and how she like had no training and all these things which is misogynistic in, in its own but like it's still interesting to, you know, consider her as, like, just another, like, you know, the girl next door, but she happens to be Mormon. And she's just writing her dream. Yeah, she she dreamed the meadow scene uh, where, like, I can't remember the exact quote, but she said that she had a really, really vivid dream in this meadow where it was a vampire and a human girl and they were in love, but he thirsted for her blood more than anyone else's blood. And they were just talking about how they loved each other, but they couldn't be with each other. 
that's the dream that started this mess. And, yeah. and like, I love it because like, like, yeah, the way to describe it is like, it, even then it's like so focused on like temptation and longing and like danger, even in this dream. And like, I think it's kind of like something like she woke up from the dream and she just had to write it and then wrote Twilight mm. in like three months. Uh, and you get the sense from the books. And I think everyone does. Like there's this amazing interview with um, Robert Pattinson where he says something about like, you shouldn't, like when he read the books for research on taking the role of Edward, he says that it seems like Stephanie is convinced she's Bella. And it was like, I'm quoting, it was a book that wasn't supposed to be published. It's reading her own sexual fantasies, uh, which is very relevant for what we're talking about because, you know, Genesis, the fall of man, it all comes to, um, you know, female sexuality and whether that's good or not. And I think that is generally just Twilight, isn't it? Like female sexuality, is it good or not? A hundred percent. I think if, if you read them, with that lens in mind it is like unbelievably hard to ignore like Bella's desire is the only constant throughout the series (laughs) yeah like it doesn't make sense but she's horny the whole four books (laughs) oh yeah like most of it is how perfect Edward's face is yeah which is perfect (laughs) for our segue into our first question you know we're gonna be talking about stuff about um talking about stuff that's the podcast same um with the first question is edward angel or demon yeah he's just such a tortured character he hates himself but the whole idea of him is that he is physically and like mentally perfect yeah when we were like planning for this episode you described him as like conflicting and conflictive which i love first like is he an angel like, I find that interesting because that is the first thing that Bella sees as well. Like, whether or not he's a vampire or monster goes later. But, like, the first thing we know is that he's hot. But not hot. He's, like, beautiful. He's, like, carved on marble. Um, he's, like, angelic and strong and, like, just gorgeous. I have, like, some quotes here because, like, open first seeing him, Bella describes him, and, like, the Collins in general, describes him as, like, devastatingly, inhumanly beautiful. And all of them have faces you never expected to see except painted by an old master as the face of an angel. And he's described as an angel. So there is, like, obviously a lot of, like, angelic references to the whole thing. I do think it's also worth pointing out that while the books themselves aren't overtly Christian, uh, there's a lot of, like, Edward specifically, and I think that's probably because he grew up in, like, the 20s, um, in, like, wherever. Um, (laughs) Same. He was clearly religious at some point in his life because he constantly brings up the question, although it's never answered, I should mention, but he constantly brings up the question of, like, whatever life there may be beyond this heaven whatever you want to call it like there is always that implication that he believes that there's something more this man is not atheist (laughs) and like bella she's never like explicitly religious no it it i think that's why like i never thought of mormonism when i was reading twilight so you know you describe your boyfriend as like an angel you describe your like niece as an angel like i was like yeah whatever but it goes so deep and i think especially when you like you think about um the like more overt comparisons uh, between like the descriptions of the vampires in Twilight and descriptions of angels in the Book of Mormon. Yeah, like we were both talking about this. I remember reading that and I was like, that is so fake. But like for real though, like like in, in the Book of Mormon, angels are described as like, like not sparkling, like it's not like specifically with the uh, with like the sun, but like they're meant to have like shining garments, and there's like this this bits about like they come in and they're they blind everyone. And like what I thought interesting when researching about this um, for the episode was that Mormon angels are not like Christian angels. Like I grew up Catholic, and like angels were just like you know they the god the the elves of santa but it's god like they're helpers and they're like mythical and they're amazing but they're like in mormonism apparently angels are meant to be like people they're meant to like deal with the like earthly things and they're meant to be resurrected people uh which is just vampires Mm -hmm. so i think there's like a, a very good case to make that like whether or not stephanie meyer like wanted to she did write an angel as um, a fictional boyfriend, like it, it, it goes beyond he's hot, he's holy. Yeah, and I think that segues very well into the next part of this discussion, which is Edward hates himself so mm. hard, and the whole conflict of the books is, and the movies, uh, the franchise, is that 
their like their nature as vampires makes them inherently dangerous. Um, they, by nature, thirst for blood. His life is naturally equated with death. Um, he, I mean, like everyone remembers the chef's kiss scene in which Robert Pattinson is like, as if you could ever resist me, as if you could ever fight me off. You know, everyone remembers that scene where, you know, Edward's like, even my scent tempts you. Like their very nature is to tempt Allah the serpent in the garden of eden he is such an overtly satanic character or vampires i should say are such an overtly satanic sort of uh beings um because the whole point of them is to make them alluring towards danger um i mean edward again he hates himself that's his whole deal he like (laughs) struggles with this for the entire series he refers to himself as a monster and like you know constantly tries to talk bella out of wanting to be a vampire because he doesn't want her to lose her soul and be a monster the whole thing with like lion fell in love lion fell over the lion is like i could kill you at any point and it goes beyond the physical it's like i am a completely different species than you that i am yeah not, I'm, I'm not you i'm not human i'm like unnatural and also lamb exist. Lamb, <laughs> lamb, <laughs> please. Yeah, let, yeah. <laughs> like she could have picked any other predator, any other like, but no, she picked um, lamb. She picked lamb and lion, the most biblical yes. sacrificial animal you can think of. That's Bella, all right. I mean, like I know Edward is like you know the on paper like the most perfect man, just like in terms of his morals and like his honor and virtue or whatever but he does like tempt bella we already talked about how horny she is but like his whole deal is that he's so beautiful and irresistible and even in his goodness in his like divinity i guess uh Mm. he's also like irresistible to bella It, it like obviously like vampires in vampire fiction as we know are meant to be satanic are meant to be like these predators that go after like young girls and it there is like a little bit of a reversal there because then she's like she's just a teenage girl who wants to have sex yeah, and that is meant to be like evil of him. So he like says that he's like, you know, like gonna corrupt her, and like there's like a whole thing in Eclipse that you like found a great quote about him being like, "I'm protecting your virtue," and she's like, "Oh, I thought you were like the old fashioned one," and he's like, "No, no, but like out of the two of us, who who has a soul, a shot of heaven, or whatever there is after this life, it goes beyond her wanting to be a vampire. It's also like he's a goody and a baddie at the same time, but he's also like horny. Well." not as horny as Bella but like he is horny he you know the whole just because I'm resisting the wine doesn't mean I can't appreciate the bouquet like he is like selfish in that sense I guess that like he would put his own desire over her like safety but he hates himself for it yeah I don't know to what extent like it's also like depicting Edward as a teenager himself like he's not Mm. he's 120 years old but he's also like I'm gonna do something stupid because I'm so drawn by you like it's also Mm. his first love so he is, yeah. he has extraordinary power, power and he's really like, he's a, you know, he's a monster, he's a demon, he could kill her at any point, but he also cannot stop seeing her in the same way that she cannot stop seeing him. Yeah. I mean, like, Midnight Sun reveals as much that he is, like, equally obsessed. Like, he literally cannot stay away from this person. Uh, yeah. yeah. Midnight Sun is such a, it's, it's a, it's a whole other thing. <laughs> L- like, side note, Midnight Sun is double the length of twilight oh my god he has so many thoughts (laughs) (laughs) yeah we need to do another episode with this (laughs) yeah midnight sun is a whole other conversation because then angel or demon is also like bella bella's perspective of edward versus edward's perspective of bella it's really interesting because like obviously it's the same person writing the same scenes twice but um like he he mirrors her in a lot of senses like uh there's a scene in twilight in which um well there's several scenes in twilight actually where bella and edward in like science class or something and they're watching a movie for all these lessons and in in twilight it like bella goes insane she literally (laughs) says like a crazy impulse to reach over and touch him to stroke his perfect face just once in the darkness nearly overwhelmed me i crossed my arms tightly across my chest my hands bawling into fists i was losing my mind and i don't have the quote from midnight sun but it's the same like it, it literally was like the lights shut off and I felt electricity tingling between me and her I balled my fists up into yeah you know I balled my hands into fists and I crossed my arms tried to put some distance like it's the same scene they're both equally horny for each other but Edward hates himself for it 
is that valid? Is, you know, is his self-hatred valid according to his own beliefs of Christianity and, and Stephanie Myers' own beliefs in Christianity is, is like, you know, what we're investigating here. Because then like, <laughs> my favorite part of this discussion is, are vampires Mormon? Yes. I mean, the answer is yes. The answer is in the Twilight universe. Correct. Um, <laughs> There's like an overwhelming amount of evidence for this <laughs> because then again if we follow the traditional literature like vampires are satanic and vampires are like devils and supernatural creatures and they're evil but no no not for stephanie meyer there's this amazing researcher writer his name is john granger and he wrote an article that has been really influential for this argument called mormon vampires in the garden of eden about twilight and he points out that carlisle was born in the mid 1660s the same period where historic Mormonism was born in Europe. <laughs> so, and he, he's, he's very famously born in the UK. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so, I am missing um, Carlisle's um, British accent, is what I'm saying. But anyway, so, like, there's that link. But the, it doesn't stop there. And especially when you consider, like, the Cullens in reference to everyone else. So, like, more notoriously the Volturi, which I think we both find um, hilarious. The Volturi is such an extra facet of this universe that didn't need to go this hard. <laughs> but Stephanie Meyer said <laughs> the Vatican City, but not Paris. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Like, it couldn't even be anywhere else. Like, the Volturi. Um, and they are in, they live in, like, a secluded town in Italy <laughs> that has, like, everyone, like, venerates them. And there's, like, festivals and processions. As you said, it's just the Vatican. I mean, New Moon is literally during the festival of Marcus or something. Like, and, like, they're utterly powerful. Self-appointed. Self-appointed. <laughs> they're just old. They're just there for tradition. Much like the church. Exactly, exactly. Like, they're self-appointed and they, like, keep everyone safe and they're, like, super powerful and ancient, um, like the Catholic Church. And then Carlisle, Daddy Mormon, um, <laughs> joins them for, like, a bit after he transforms and, like, he goes through it and he's still in Europe. But then he, like, he says in New Moon that he didn't like the way that the Volturi operated. So he left and he, like, split into his own little faction and created vegetarian vampirism and his own family or his own church. You know, like he is the cool Mormon vampire who said, fuck the Catholic. Yeah. And let's talk about the familial structures of the Cullen family and the like the Mormon values of family. Because, I mean, if the Cullen, what's it called? Coven? Yes. Yeah. Coven? Our coven's churches in this universe, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Um, yeah, because, like, clearly Carlisle is a Joseph Smith figure. Like, yes. he is, like, everyone's spiritual, like, guide. He is the one that directs all these people to his way of life. And then they all become his family members. Yes. <laughs> and it is meant to be, like, you know, like, we're in the side of the Cullens. Um, the Volturi are the villains for most of it, but they're, like, the necessary evil. But, like, we're always on the side of the Collins, and it, like, Carlisle's way of life, as you said, is meant to be the best way of life. It's meant to be, like, sustainable. It's meant to be, like, full of forgiveness and stuff like that because they don't kill, um, they kill animals instead of people. Mm -hmm. And everyone else subscribes to it, and they just become both family and, like, couples. And the, the bit that everyone loves to talk about Twilight is the fact that everyone knows that these adoptees like with each other like 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 carlisle was matchmaking as he was adopting children yeah. and they're all siblings but they're also have been married for 50 years and they're all super tight-knit and it's super incestuous and they're all like they all treat each other like siblings yeah and like like i know that like it, like in the books and the movies or whatever they keep clarifying like oh yeah like they are together like whatever but they are like to like in their relationship to Carlisle is always going to be that of like a father figure. So in that sense, they're always going to be like siblings to each other in that dynamic. And it doesn't matter like who's older. No, it, Esme is the mom. Carlisle is the dad. Yeah. Um, and no matter like Edward being older than Esme, <laughs> he's still the child. It's like they're yeah. like it, it, like regardless of their age when they were turned or the the age when they were born. This is just like the family dynamic. And they're a huge family, a la Mormons. <laughs> exactly. I also do think it's interesting that in the beginning, before like Alice and Jasper and everyone joined the coven, Edward posed as Esme's brother. 
Oh, I um, forgot about that. And like, when did that change? Like, at what point was Esme like, hey, how would you feel about me being my son? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> because like, Carla and, and Edward are like the OG vampires, like the OG, like they're, they're, they're yeah. associates. And then somehow down the line, he becomes the son and everyone else becomes Carla's children. Yeah. Um, I don't have a Mormon parallel to that. It's just weird. <laughs> yeah, no, there's, there's, there's a moral to this. There's no thoughts. It's just something to point out. Yeah. Um, I mean, how old are Carlisle and Esme meant to be, like, physically? Yeah, it is really freaky because Carlisle, in the movies at least, was cast, like, early 30s. Um, yeah. I think it's meant to be, like, late 20s for both of them. I'm actually going to Google this because this is interesting. His physical age was 23. <laughs> no <laughs> that is so stressful Fuck. oh my god we're older than <laughs> that we're older than that. carlisle Cullen. <laughs> that's horrible oh my god so there's a six year <laughs> difference between the <laughs> the children and the like <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much, whoever did the casting for the film, <laughs> for picking an, an adult. Esme's physical age is meant to be 26, which is also too young. I thought, in my brain, Carla was like 28, and then Esme was like 31. 23. Oh my god. The makeup oh, skills yeah. of this man. I assume Carlisle is just putting on wrinkles. No, yeah, how is anyone accepting a 23-year-old doctor? <laughs> <laughs> education for 23 for doctors that's at least 10 years oh my god he's a child prodigy <laughs> but i mean this is the absurd nature of twilight like we have a 23 year old father <laughs> <laughs> with like a bunch of kids who are like 18 yes um, some of whom are like older than his wife and yet we're family because we said we are because we conform to this like what's the name like structure yeah and, like Something that, like, I always thought, I think genuinely, is the found family um, part of Twilight that people don't talk about enough. Because I didn't necessarily want to be a vampire. I wanted to be part of a family. And I remember, like, the vote in New Moon was so, like, oh my god, like, they're defending her. Like, Bella has such an army of people behind her decisions. It's not only Edward and Bella. And that is so problematic. Imagine if your, like, father-in-law is voting on whether or not you should marry your boyfriend. Like, that's not it. <laughs> but it is the structure that they have created where someone's, especially with the whole, like, vampire thing, like, are they all risking their lives? But it's also, like, are we are we letting her into the church even though she wasn't born a Mormon? Like, it, it generally just feels like it. It's, like, someone's issues are everyone's issues yeah. in the Cullen family. Very much like a church. Oh, yeah. So Carlisle is the ultimate cult leader. Let's talk about that. Yeah. At 23. <laughs> like most cult leaders, uh, I guess. The most fucking charismatic 23-year-old ever. Um, let's talk about that in comparison to Charlie Swan, everyone's favorite character, and the Swan family in general. Because Bella's whole origin story is that like her family was never together uh like you know um her parents separated when she was really little she was like kind of split between like her past in forks and like her present in in arizona um renee is described as this like perpetual child uh, a kind of incapable mother um who doesn't really have like that wisdom and sageness that you kind of expect mother figures to have and instead bella is Obviously, like, there's loads of references to her being, like, born middle-aged, especially from her mom, who says she was born middle-aged. And her, yeah, like, Bella's, like, just, like, ability to take on the role of housewife, like, no problem. Like, she moves in with Charlie and immediately starts cooking dinner for him every day. And Charlie is this passive, absent parent who is incapable of exhibiting any leadership. Like, he doesn't really enforce any rules while Bella is there. Like, obviously, other than when she's grounded for, like, two weeks for going to... uh phoenix and and trying to yeah anyway <laughs> like he doesn't really reinforce any rules and like there's loads of references in the books to like 
Charlie being really easy to live he's with. He's just a dude. He's just a dude. He wants to. He, go he goes night. fishing every weekend. He goes down to the reservation to watch the game with Billy Black. Um, he is a man of simple needs. Even when Bella turns into a vampire, he really said, um, "Need to know bases only." He, like, he, does, he doesn't want to know. Like he is so far step back. Like he does not want to get involved with anything. As opposed to Carlisle, who's like. I will micromanage all my children's lives because I have like a moral code to uphold. And like, Carla does micromanage everyone, but um, he also does it really well. <laughs> he does, doesn't he? Like, he does it in a way yeah. that makes him feel like they're coming back to him for choice. Like, you know, when Edward leaves for a few years and then yeah. comes crawling back, basically, like, yes. well, actually, your your way of life is better than whatever the fuck I've been doing. It's Edward leaves the Mormon church, becomes a sinner, and then he's like, I don't want this. I'm gonna go back to Mormonism. Literally. And like every like it, it is like very much of a choice um in, in the Collins case. Like they all like there are loads of quotes where Carlisle is like, you know, it's their choice. Like they ch- like they came here, you know, whatever. And I think it's interesting also to talk about how Charlie in the first book says about the Collins, like, you know, Bella is just kind of like, Oh, do you know much about the Collins? Because she's curious but trying to play cool. Um, and he says, you know, you know, they're all they're all, you know really tight uh you know carlisle does great for the forks hospital like he should be earning a way higher salary somewhere else and specifically he says and they stick together the way a family should camping trips every other weekend so clearly he like craves that sort of stability that tightness that the cullen family do that his doesn't yeah like there's like a default like not only Stephanie Meyer, but like everyone in this universe knows what a good family is meant to look like. And it is the Cullens. It is the Cullens, even though it's fucking weird. And most people in school are like, they're all together, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. And they don't talk to anyone else, right? Yeah. Like they are so tight. They will marry each other. And yeah, Esme is. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about Esme as well, who is not a character. <laughs> let's face it. <laughs> Does she have more she than... She has a backstory, though. She has a backstory, but they all do. Um, true, she's, true. Not a, she's not a character, though. Like, who is she? She is the she's perfect mom. mother. She's mommy. <laughs> she's a 26-year-old <laughs> <Honestly>. mommy. <laughs> How I um, want them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, like, the fact... Like, you know how every single vampire in this fucking franchise has, like, a deep-seated, like, thing that they crave, that they, like, mourn from their from their human lives like Esme's whole deal is that she lost a child and therefore she adopted like eight (laughs) yes (laughs) like she had a really tragic marriage which is another way like Stephanie Meyer like keeps pointing at all of these terrible families that are in the Cullens and it's like all of these broken people arrived to the Cullens uh like arrived into this coven slash family slash church and like Esme had like a really abusive relationship, lost a child, tried to commit suicide, um, and was literally saved by um, Carlisle. Um, and like, I guess just joined his coven. And then Bella, in turn, joins this coven as well. She is no longer the lonely only child of two separated parents. She has a gaggle of siblings. <laughs> A husband and present parents. And a child at 18. <laughs> so yeah, it's just, it's heaven. It's it's the perfect, yeah. It's it's in the Mormon stru- family structure. It's 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 portrayed as a saving grace. It's portrayed very favorably. And it is basically the opposite of everything Bella had or like Bella's family of origin. But I think it's interesting to discuss Bella's arc in this series because she goes from this sort of, like she's really put together like for a teenager you know she's mm. mature for she's her middle age she's middle aged when she was born she's super competent she takes care of her parents the way that a child shouldn't um mm. do you think she has a lot of trauma from that probably interesting um, <laughs> it's not really to address another episode of Bella's um trauma and uh, attachment style <laughs> Definitely, um, definitely anxious attachment style. But anyway, but yeah, it's interesting to, to watch Bella go from you know what we've just said, like the, the born middle aged, really competent human being, to this newborn vampire, which is 
you know, strong, agile, she achieves bodily perfection. But in the course of the Twilight Saga, she fulfills everything that her human body really needs to do. Like she matures in the bodily sense as well. Like her, her body catches up to her mind. You know, she gets pregnant, she delivers a child, and then she's reborn. So she fulfills the role of the mother um, before she gets to come to this like blissful, immortal life. Yeah, almost like she does everything that a woman is supposed to do traditionally before she is able to fall and be born again. Yeah, but again, Bella is not like other girls. And even as a newborn vampire, she skips that bit. Like she, like, yeah, all the physical stuff, but uh, the mental bit, she doesn't struggle with at all. Like she is just like this mature newborn, which is really interesting because everything that's bad about becoming a vampire, she essentially bypasses. Like she becomes the one exception to it, which I think begs the question whether or not uh, like Bella's transformation is a good or a bad thing in Twilight. Because like, that's the moral dilemma that Edward and Bella grapple with the whole book series like Edward is just like no you'll lose your soul um you know his desire for Bella's blood is like both you know certain death for her but also like conflated with like lust um you know at the very end his whole condition for turning her into a vampire is for her to marry him and then in turn you know her condition is that she has he has sex with her like it's all like super linked and yet all of those worries don't end up being like founded by the time bella turns into a vampire because she manages to keep herself intact like she is the same mature woman who you know cares for others and like doesn't kill those hikers in her first hunting trip while also being everything she wasn't when she was a human yeah like she genuinely just achieves perfection in every sense like she like ascends yeah like the like temptation ends up being like a a segue into the very thing edward feared bella was gonna lose yeah so like they they both give into their temptation at the end like you know they have their sex he drinks her blood (laughs) She becomes a vampire, and they're all good. They have a happy ending. So reading, you know, Bella as a reverse for all narrative argues that everything that's bad about, or, you know, everything that is um, sinful, everything that humanity supposedly lost in the original biblical fall is moot in Twilight. Yeah, by giving in to temptation, she doesn't condemn herself and humanity. She ends up, you know succeeding and going to heaven she returns to eden instead of is like you know expelled from it she literally dies for motherhood and is rewarded with heaven isn't that not the most (laughs) christian thing and like that makes sense even if like we are incredibly even if we are like hyper analyzing twilight stephanie meyer has said that her greatest influence in writing the twilight series was her religion Um, And it's not like word for word, but it makes sense to read it as a fortunate fall, because in a way, a fortunate fall is a Mormon one. John Granger, in the same um, essay that I talked about, um, explains that for Mormons, the fall is not a bad thing. It was actually a good, even a necessary thing for human salvation, necessary in order for Adam and Eve to marry and reproduce. This important step, which is marriage, uh, in this progression from mortality to post-mortal life in the celestial kingdom. And I, that's just a summary for Twilight. Like, unlike Catholics, Mormons, like, sound cool if you think about it like that. Reproduction and marriage, obviously under God and with all of the conditions, is not a bad thing. It's not, like, a result of female sexuality and female desire and female temptation. It's actually what leads to eternal life and, um, like, eternal happiness. Um, and it's not only for, like, the select few or, like, the lonely, like, the Volturi. <laughs> um, I am not arguing pro-Mormonism, but that really is what Twilight is doing. And, like, when it comes to, like, the feminism of it, like, I'm not saying that Mormons are the most the, like, particularly feminist, but, like, Twilight isn't particularly feminist. In a way, it is, like, you know, like, celebrating female desire under the so-called, like, Mormon ideals. I know people hate Twilight because it promotes traditional gender roles but like Stephanie Meyer 
replied to those like complaints by saying like you know feminism is about choice like in like I, I'm quoting she says the foundation of feminism is being able to choose so one of the weird things about modern feminism is that some feminists seem to be putting their own limits on women's choices that feels backward to me as if you can't choose a family on your own terms and still be considered a strong woman which like fair yeah like yeah for 2007 yeah and like we shouldn't be like oh you're not a feminist because you're like you know praising children and like a family because in the end like bella chooses that it is also interesting to consider the dichotomy between bella as like an incompetent person with two left feet um and like fragile and magnet for trouble and her own sort of like inner strength like there's a quote from uh twilight um this is after edward saves her from james and you know she just begs him basically turn her into a vampire and she says but um i'll be the first to admit that i have no experience with relationships but it just seems logical that a man and a woman have to be somewhat equal as in one of them can't always be swooping in and saving the other one they have to save each other equally so like there is this awareness of like Bella's not a uh, damsel in distress. Like, there, that isn't what Stephanie Meyer is trying to write. Like, I don't think Twilight is a damsel in distress narrative. I, I'm also not saying that she's a strong female character. Like, I'm also... Like, we're not arguing that she is who we're all dreaming of and, like, the representation we want it. But it is, like, a strong dichotomy. You're right. Mm-hmm. Like, in a way, it is, like, this weird thing where, like, modern sexuality is embedded in the traditional package. So, like, Bella is, like, a modern girl. And she gets to be the savior. And she gets to, through her own sexuality and her choices, like, achieve perfection and help the family that has welcomed her. Uh, and she gets to have sex after marriage. But she, like, gets to, you know. Yeah. And it's, like, really good <laughs> sex, apparently. I don't believe her for a second (laughs) like side note like she like you know ascends when they have sex apparently like it's like amazing i just can't imagine that it can be that good because he can't do anything with his mouth i mean (laughs) why can't he is it really sharp teeth is that it it's the venom like all the scenes of them kissing in the books is like he has his lips firmly sealed they don't even make out (laughs) no they can't because he has venom (laughs) also he's a 120 year old virgin who cannot use anything other than his dick i'm just like can you even imagine like fingers like they are rock hard and ice cold i mean that's a that's a glass dildo if i've ever heard of one that's so true but i mean would it warm up yeah, if he puts them in in, 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 in boiling water, does it help? Because, <laughs> like, Edward just, like, maintains the temperature. So, like, if he, you know, kept using his fingers, for instance, would they eventually heat up with her own body warmth? Interesting. Because <laughs> it's not like, you know, like, all of the scenes of the cuddling, and she's, like, swaddled in a blanket. So clearly he doesn't, like, eventually heat up from her own body heat. Yeah, no, I generally don't think they would, because... It doesn't get warm up. If anything, she would lose lose heat in trying to warm him up, but he would never absorb that temperature. <laughs> what we're getting at, uh, what we're getting to, is that this f- <laughs> this sexual experiences with an ice man is what gets Bella into heaven. Yeah, and you know, God bless that she becomes a vampire because like there is there is a, like a, a bit in in Breaking Dawn after she becomes a vampire and like Edward and Bella have like their first trysts as you know, both immortals. And I just remember this like one sentence very vividly where she's like, it was amazing kissing him. My lips kept their shape, uh, like instead of molding to his. Oh my God. (laughs) It's such a a throwaway line. Like it's literally nothing. It's like you're kissing a wall. Yeah. I mean, like she describes it as kissing a marble statue for most of the series. And then she becomes a vampire and it's like, well, my lips kept their shape. (laughs) oh my god the point is Edward definitely could not have made Bella come during their honeymoon I do not think that is what gets you into heaven I because how many Mormons have experienced that you know like I Mm. don't know if that's like a requirement in the Book of Mormon Um, I think it's the and then the thing right it's more like it's marriage what gets her into heaven but (laughs) and marriage happens exactly and motherhood but motherhood and marriage are like intrinsically linked yeah. with sex so it is just stephanie meyer being like i actually just want sex but 
we're gonna make this convoluted and you can never want sex unless you want kids and, and marriage um mm-hmm. and you know what kids and marriage are super good because they get you to heaven so true <laughs> amen to that <laughs> <laughs> so breaking dawn begins with an epigraph from the poem childhood is the kingdom where nobody dies by edna saint vincent millet And the epigraph goes, childhood is not from birth to a certain age. And at a certain age, the child is grown and puts away childish things. Childhood is the kingdom where nobody dies. Which is whack for being the epigraph to the last book. (laughs) Yeah, if you consider the plot of Twilight, which is mostly about this vampire war happening, that is a nonsense epigraph. But if you consider it under Fortunate Fall, it's, it's great. It's very relevant. It's very relevant and it basically confirms everything because, you know, what childhood is the kingdom where nobody dies. Childhood, like heaven, is endless eternity with your parents as a child. You always have the room to be a child, like, because you never have to sort of grow up. Like, you never have to, like, there's no running out of time, basically. Um, In the poem, there's another line that goes, tomorrow, even the day after tomorrow, if you're busy having fun, is plenty of time to say, I'm sorry, mother. So there's always time to apologize, always time to be carefree. There's always time to do more, to play more. Yeah, it's like, it's eternal life with your family. And that is the ending of Twilight. That's what joining the Collins is like, is eternal life with your family. And it's strange because you keep saying, you know, like, she's bodily perfect. She's a mother. She's done everything. Like, she is also a mother. She's also a child. Yeah, she gets the family she never had in both the sense of, like, her uh, family, like, that she grew up with and that she gets a mother. But she also gets the family she never had in that she has a daughter and a husband and a (laughs) son-in-law. There's another thing. So do you think it would be fair to say that Edward's an angel then? Because... Like, for how much he hates himself, you know, he gives her this. Yeah. Or I think, you know, he is an angel, yes. But is he really an angel so much as he's just, like, the messenger angel from Carlisle? (laughs) Interesting. (laughs) He is the missionary. Yeah. Um, From, you know, and Bella hears the good word and um, makes the decision. You know, agency is, like, a whole thing for Stephanie Meyer. (laughs) Yeah. Um, you know, like she chooses to follow um, these rules and join this family and sacrifice herself um, until she she makes it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, Edward is an angel because Carlyle's God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because Carlyle is at least um, Joseph Smith. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I also think like the whole God. I mean, God might be a bit far. He's a prophet. <laughs> yeah, but he did also create all of these. That is true perfect angels yeah it's true the bottom line is sex got bella into heaven like her love yeah. got bella into heaven so the question at the heart of all of this is was stephanie meyer just horny <laughs> i mean the answer is yes the answer is we've taken an hour of our lives to say yes um like i don't know like i always like the more i thought about it i was like yeah i think twilight is a negotiation of someone who either is very sexually empowered or not at all and just wants to explore, you know, like just wants to talk about sexuality and desire um, in a way that still doesn't feel like sacrilegious, like in a way that still justifies it to herself that she is being a good Christian, Mormon, whatever. Yeah. So yeah, like she seems to just be like reconciling with her own horniness through Twilight because like, as you said, like it is her own desire, her own attraction. It, it isn't religious. It's literally like she likes this dude and she's willing to do anything to have him, to live forever with him, to fuck him. Um, she's willing to marry him at 18 to fuck him. Like that's generally it. Like in Twilight, in a way, it's like because it's her choice is like feminist to marry the guy, like, you know, you're ch- like you're, the guy you've met for four months in junior year who later left for like <laughs> all of senior year. Oh, yeah. Let's not talk about how long their relationship actually was because it was long distance for a good six months. <laughs> not even long distance. They, they, he ghosted her for six months. <laughs> and it's still super, it's still like super feminist yeah. that she married him because, you know, that eventually leads to like, a holy state that eventually leads to like all of her dreams being realized to her getting the family she never had like in twilight meyer gives us like 
all of us tweens, teens, and like adults, a horny but sexless romance where like our deep desires are actually sacred and lead us to a happy eternal life. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Gifted Child Symposium. We really hope you found it interesting, thought-provoking, and if nothing else, amusing. Please leave a review on whatever your preferred podcast platform is, as it really helps us out. And if you really enjoyed, please share us with your friends. You can find us on Instagram at giftedcs.pod. We'd love to hear from you. As a postscript, let's talk about the connection between Mormonism and Native Americans. (laughs) Like, it's just whack. Like... The the wackest thing about Twilight is the Native Americans, in my opinion. Like, oh, absolutely. Because why are they there? Like, apparently Stephanie Meyer had never been to the, that part of the U.S. I think she probably Google mapped, like, Forks and then realized there was a reservation nearby. Um, and I thought it was random, right? But then you look up, like, you do, like, four minutes of Googling and you realize there's, like, huge links between Mormonism and Native Americans and it's like really weird and I cannot explain why right like these are just facts I read I do not know why nor do I think it makes sense uh, or is reasonable but like apparently Mormons think they are like they go far back <laughs> from with the Native Americans and they see um Native Americans like according to like Mormon teachings and stuff and like ancient beliefs or whatever they see them as like like being related to them and like the lost children of Israel <laughs> so the yeah like the first missions like back in the founding of like Mormonism were to like Native American tribes like that you know Mormons thought that they needed to like bring them back to Christianity it's it's bad <laughs> yeah I mean like let, also let's not talk about the dynamics between the reservation like and like forks in the books because like in like for instance like when Jacob starts transforming and he keeps like ripping his clothes to shreds uh there's a line where he like shreds some shoes and Sam goes like or someone goes like ah I guess he'll be barefoot from now that was the last pair Billy could afford what holy shit (laughs) meanwhile the vampires are just vibing with their eight sports cars yes Oh my god, I did not know. I never thought about like the economics and like <laughs> yeah, let's not the think. reparations of this. Oh god, no, it's just so whack. But also, this really supports our argument. Um, and I just want to say whatever you think Twilight is weird or random, it is, but it's because it's Mormon. Like, it all just links to this. It's not us being random and being like, the, like reading Mormonism to Twilight. Mormonism is in Twilight so hard that even. <laughs> fucking that even like all the all the wolves have uh hebrew names yeah which we found out are stephanie meyer's siblings names she named all of her wolves after her siblings and there seems like there's a lot of them because stephanie meyer is mormon <laughs> maybe as many siblings as the cullens like like yes like we're not saying like the, the wolves should be called dances with wolves or some bullshit right like but like why are they called seth jacob paul uh, but it's it has to be. It, it, why couldn't they just be like anything else, right? Like it, it is. I think it's just because of Mormonism. Like, I'm sure she found it interesting. It could have been like, oh, there's another town of werewolves. Like, there's forks, and then there's like this other town of werewolves. No, no, <laughs> Native Americans. But I will say, in Twilight, it is canon. There are werewolves that change with the new moon, with the full moon. Oh, God. Like, there is a separate type of werewolf beyond the Native Americans. <laughs> Where are they at? <laughs> Where are they at? Where are they at? Why is it briefly mentioned in Breaking Dawn? Oh, oh is it? Yeah. Where are they at? Where are they at? No one knows. No, I mean, I feel like Stephanie Meyer, A, is Mormon, and B, saw a really convenient geographical divide between, like, the reservation and Forks, and was like, yeah, that's the treaty line for this <laughs> fantasy treaty that I have made up. <laughs> so, like, the rules of vampirism and lycanthropy in the Twilight universe. They don't make sense. No. It makes sense that they're Native Americans, though. Because <laughs> because um, she's crazy and she's Mormon. Yeah. She's crazy and she's Mormon. That's the takeaway. That's that it. is the only lens in which you'll be able to read Twilight and find any pattern in it. Re- rereading this series with the lens of Mormonism in mind has been the greatest joy of my life. Highly recommended. 10 out of 10 experience. Both of us being not from the US, growing up with Twilight, we just thought it was a whack series. So, like, examining it under religious and cultural stuff 
um, and like specific, you know, like religious beliefs and like dynamics just makes it make sense. Yeah. It's like, whoa, Stephanie Meyer isn't that batshit. She just comes from a really, really batshit religion. Yeah. I don't think she was trying to get us into Mormonism. She just wrote, she just, she's just did what every writer should do. She wrote what she knew. 